In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. May the Lord bestow upon us his blessing, mercy, grace, and wisdom, now and ever to the age of all ages, amen. <clears throat> Welcome back. Um, we're just about done with the series. Uh, God willing, uh, after the talk today, we'll have one more session uh, and uh, we'll be done. So uh, just kind of like to uh, summarize what we've been studying in the last couple of lectures. Um, we've been studying a lot of uh, ologies, <laughs> right? So we started with theology and understanding who God is, um, the essence of God, the, focused on God the Father, and then we went into Christology, studying the, the Son, the only begotten Son uh, of God, G our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, <clears throat> and we studied especially um, the, the unity of his divinity and humanity, and then we spoke of his mission and his service to humanity and, and how he came to save the world and how he saved the world through his um, death and resurrection in soteriology. And then God willing today, um, we'll focus on the next two ologies, which is pneumatology or study of the Holy Spirit, which we did a whole series on and we'll get to that in a minute. And then uh, today we'll focus more on ecclesiology, which is the study of the church. Okay, and then we'll continue, God willing, next time, as we said. <clears throat> so um, the pneumatology, what is that part in the creed? Um, <clears throat> is the part in red that, yes, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who perceives the Father, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And then today, um, we'll also conclude with that first half uh, in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, and next time we'll do uh, those last two parts. <clears throat> so before we get to that, um, I thought it was important to kind of give you a, a brief summary of the three ecumenical councils. Um, and this helps us um, because, you know, as we know, um, if we look at the history of what happened in the church, um, <clears throat> much of what we have in the creed um, was believed in since the beginning, since the beginning of the church or the found, founding of the church in the first century. Um, but, um, and it was passed from generation to generation after that, um, but it was never really formally written down until after uh, several heresies or false teachings spread in the church. Um, <clears throat> and so um, the creed was more of a compilation of the response to those heresies, just to ensure that um, the faith would continue to be passed on from generation to generation without fault, without change um, in, in, in what we believe and what we know to be true. Um, so the first, uh, second and third um, ecumen and ecumenical councils, which just means, you know, the gathering of the church or the universal ch uh, church meetings of various bishops, um, and if, if you notice in the liturgy, we say the 318 assembled at Nicaea, the 150 at Constantinople, and the 200 at Ephesus. This is a reference to these three councils. Um, and um, this is a good summary of, of what uh, the different uh, differences between um, the councils dealt with, um, but just focus specifically on the second to last row here where it talks about the heresy. Um, and then you'll begin to understand why the creed um, looks the way it does, right? Um, because the bulk of it has to do with the divinity of the Son, as we have said. And what we're going to talk about today is more a stem of what transpired in the second and, and third councils as well. And um, by the way, this also, the creed also um, includes, has an introduction, which we didn't really study, but most of it has to do with um, the third council. Um, uh, so anyway, <clears throat> um, this is just to help um, uh, when we go into the depth of what we're studying and why regarding to the creed, it's, it's, it's important to understand the background uh, as well. <clears throat> so um, let's uh, jump into it. Um, oh, oh, sorry, <laughs> what, one more point. Um, the second ecumenical council here, um, it, the Council of Constantinople in 381, the main heresy that Macedonius was, was teaching was saying that the Holy Spirit is not God. He is not divine, but is a power, right? The power of God, the dynamic power of God. And of course, this is not what we believe. Um, and also another um, her heretic named Eunomius, he 
he didn't just deny the the divinity of the Holy Spirit, but also of the only begotten Son, which we I hope we already covered um, in the past. <clears throat> so um, uh, we've actually done an entire series on uh, who the Holy Spirit is and what he does and how we can find in the Old and New Testaments um, proof from that. Um, and more importantly, how he works in the church and in our life. Um, so God willing, if you look at um, the description below, um, I will put um, the link for this series. Um, <clears throat> so um, hopefully uh, that will be uh, helpful to you. Um, but if, if you don't wanna go through that, I'll just give some bullet points um, in the next couple slides of especially the biblical uh, references uh, pertaining to this passage here of on the Holy Spirit. So we say, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord. The Lord here is reference to his divinity. Um, and that's just one verse, but there's plenty of other verses as you'll see in the series if you go to that. Um, the giver of life, because as God, God is the source of life, <clears throat> Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, and the Lord Jesus Christ himself, it is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who gives life, right? Who proceeds from the Father. This is where there were a lot of uh, differences in opinion, especially with the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, they believe in something called the filioque, which um, they added to this part of the creed in the past, in the history of the church, who says, and they said, who proceeds from the Father and the Son? And this is not even biblically accurate. If, if you just use the words of the Lord Jesus Christ in John 15, 26 and 27, he says, the Holy Spirit, the Parklete, it's another name of the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> I will send to you from the Father. Um, and then a few words later, who proceeds from the Father? He doesn't say who proceeds from me, okay? Um, <clears throat> so anyway, uh, if you want more, <laughs> again, please go to uh, uh, the series. Um, who spoke in the prophets, and this refers to the inspiration um, of the Holy Spirit uh, to write scripture, okay? Um, he filled those who wrote the word of God um, and directed their minds and, and, and their hearts and their hands to write down the Holy Scripture for us, right? <clears throat> and again, here are some uh, verses uh, for you to go into the depth with. Okay, um, and also, you know, as uh, uh, the apostles say, the Holy Spirit spoke rightly through the prophets, okay? Um, we'll move on. <laughs> so the next part is the ecclesiology, which is basically the study of the church. Um, and this is a very short sentence, but as you'll see from the study of today, um, we can go really deep, really fast. And each one of these characteristics, um, we can spend, you know, uh, a long time studying. Um, and uh, this is how the Orthodox Church defines herself um, in the simplest uh, of forms. Um, but when we use each of these terms, um, there is a hidden depth to it, uh, as I just said. So let's go into it. So the church is one, right? Uh, as St. Paul says, and as we read in the first hour, or we pray in the first hour of the Holy Agbeya, um, there is one Lord, one faith, and what, one baptism, right? Um, and we know from the previous studies that God is one, and he is of one essence, right? And the goal of uh, Christianity, or the goal of the spiritual str struggle, or the, the goal of what God wants to do with us, is to become one with him and to become one with another, right? And so we strive for unity. As the Lord Jesus Christ prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane in John chapter 17, he said, he's praying to God the Father, that they all may be one, humanity, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, uh, that they also may be one in us, right? That they may be one, just as we are one, I in them and you in me, okay? Um, so the church is supposed to help us to, to bring us close and united with God, um, and also united with one another because we are one church 
and there is one bride to the one bridegroom, right? Um, <clears throat> and so the church is supposed to be united. Um, and all the divisions that we have now, is it's not God's will. Um, but at the same time, if there is any wrong teaching out there that is not in line with the, the one church, then that is not considered part of the church. Um, <clears throat> so uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of divisions and um, the, the divisions that are due to heresy are fine <laughs> and, and they're needed, right? Because we can't just have, okay, everyone come in and believe whatever you want just so that we have um, one family or one bride of Christ. That's not the bride of Christ, right? Um, and on the flip side, um, the other people who believe in the same thing that we believe should not be separated from us. And, and this is what we're striving for, the, the ecclesiastical unity or the unity between the other churches who believe in, in, in what, at least what we are saying here in, in this uh, series. So we pray um, for the unity of the church. Um, <clears throat> uh, okay, so what does it mean when we say the church is holy? Um, there, so for each of these four categories, uh, the one holy Catholic apostolic, we're going to give three main um, uh, points, and don't worry, I'll summarize it uh, at the end. Um, but <clears throat> so the first characteristic of the holiness of the church means that if something or someone is holy, it's set apart, right? So that's what we mean by consecration, right? So as God is holy, the church is called to be holy. And each part of the church, each member of the church, including you and me, are, are uh, striving to be holy, right? Um, <clears throat> and um, the simple definition of the word agios, which means holy, it means is not of this world, right? As, as the Lord told us, uh, you are not of the world, right? Um, and I chose you to be out of the world or separated, right? Um, and so... Um, that's why there is no um, unity between what is holy and what is not holy, um, to be set apart and to be consecrated, um, and not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind, which is, you know, the, the, the goal of our church, especially the Holy Transfiguration, to be transformed, um, not to, to conform to the things that are not holy, okay? Um, so this is the first part, is to separate yourself from, from evil or from wrong or from darkness. Um, and th that's that's our part. W what's God's part is to make us holy. Right? We can't make ourselves holy, but at least we can set ourselves apart. Right? The second thing is that when God makes us holy, that's what we call san sanctification. And this happens especially through uh, the sacraments, the mysteries of the church. Right? And St. Paul um, describes this in his epistle to the Ephesians. Um, he says, Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present to her himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Um, so as the bride of Christ, she is purified by the bridegroom. And uh, by the way, we, we read from this passage on, in the wedding ceremony or in the mystery of uh, the crowning. Uh, <clears throat> and so, again, the objective of the purification of, of the bride is that she should be holy and without blemish because she's going to be united to the bridegroom who is all holy, okay? Um, so the church works to sanctify its believers um, because, again, uh, the believer cannot have part or be a member of the church if they are not holy. So at least we strive for holiness and we ask God to, to sanctify us um, through the sacramental life and through the work of the Holy Spirit. Again, go to the lecture and uh, the, the last, I think, uh, uh, this, sorry, go, if you go to the series, the last lecture or two have to do with this concept of sanctification. Okay. Um, <clears throat> again, St. Paul says to the Thessalonians, God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he rejects this, does not reject man, but God who has given us his Holy Spirit. Okay. Um, and then when St. John writes in his epistle, you have an anointing from the Holy One. He's talking about here the mystery of chrismation 
or the sacrament of life. So the Holy Spirit works to anoint us and to sanctify us. Um, and he also leads us to repentance, right? And this is, again, the sacrament of repentance and confession. Um, <clears throat> so the third thing that, that God does to help us to, to, to make us holy is that we strive for the life of perfection and we imitate Christ. Um, and uh, again, St. Paul says to the Ephesians, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So before the foundation of the world, God is calling his church to be holy and, and, and pure. Um, and uh, therefore, we have to exercise our self told so this toward godliness. This is the striving in our spiritual life, in our daily life, to, to keep ourselves pure. Um, uh, so God makes us pure through the sacraments, but we have to continue to try our best to, to exercise ourselves uh, toward godliness. Okay, <clears throat> so the third characteristic is that the church is Catholic. And this is, we don't mean here um, uh, the Roman Catholic Church, um, but if, if you look at the definition of the word itself, it means to be, uh, 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 to supersede or to go above, you know, the, the different divisions that we have in our life, whether it's by time or group or, or people or place, um, the church is not limited by those things. Um, <clears throat> and um, the church not only spans, you know, all places and all people, but all times, all, all centuries, um, and exists regardless, just like God is timeless. The, the church is timeless. We can't say, oh, the church doesn't apply to our time today. So we have to change what the church believes. That's, that's not the Orthodox teaching. Um, so St. Paul says it best in the beginning of when he speaks to the Hebrews. He says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, God had in his mind um, the, the concept of the church from the beginning not just in the New Testament, right? That we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to, to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ himself. Um, and um, so some, and this is the teaching of the church fathers that tell us, don't think um, the church just started with Christ, right? Um, the, the concept of the church was from the beginning, from, from Adam. Um, and even before that, as St. As Paul says, before the foundation of the world. Um, and the Psalms say, remember your congregation, which speaking to God, which you have purchased uh, from of old. And the, the fathers quote these verses when they, when they say the same thing. Um, and uh, for example, we say, the fathers say that uh, the ministers of the church are including the angels and the prophets. Um, and... Uh, Here's a couple of quotes here. St. Augustine says, the church is of ancient, that's a typo, sorry, birth. Um, the church has been on earth ever since saints have been called saints. And even before that, and, he, and then he starts talking about um, Noah and Abel and Enoch, um, even, <laughs> right? The, the Old Testament, um, the holy ones, the righteous and the just. And Origen also says, uh, the church, or she is called the bride of Christ from the beginning of the human race um, and from the foundation of the world. And he refers to, to the verses that we just uh, mentioned, especially Hebrews chapter one. Um, so the church is timeless. The second thing is the church is, uh, we can't say placeless, but it's, it's not limited to a certain location, right? Yes, we have um, the the building, which we call the church, but here we're, we're talking about the group of believers, right? Um, so we can't say the church just belongs in Egypt, right? But it, it, it should go everywhere, right? So as St. Ignatius of Antioch says, where, wherever the Christ is, there's the church, right? And um, where is God? God is, is uh, omnipresent, right? Um, and St. René says, the illustrious church is everywhere. The wine press is dug everywhere, a symbol of the church, for those who receive the spirit are everywhere. 
Um, and so this promotes the idea that the church has to uh, serve anyone and everyone. And by serving them, and whether or not they, they are believers yet, maybe, you know, by that service, they will come to believe and know the true God. Um, and so we have a responsibility as Christians to help spread uh, the word, um, whether um, by our words or by our deeds or, or by our love or all of the above. Okay, so the church is not limited to a time, not limited to a place, not limited to a certain group of people, right? As the Old Testament was just the, the Israelites, right? Um, but no, uh, St. Paul corrects this as following the spirit of Christ, saying there's no Jew nor Greek, there's no slave nor free. It's not just for, you know, the elite, an elite group, right? There's neither male nor female, um, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. And he also says this in Colossians, um, almost word for word, right? <clears throat> um, and we see this in the book of Revelation. Every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation was redeemed. Of course, these are the, the, the believers from every, but, but once the church preaches to it, the, 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 the truth to every group of people or every creature, which is the objective of the church, right? Then God redeems um, by the blood of his only begotten son. Um, and, and so um, all the church equalizes all believers in, in Christ. And the goal of the church is to bring all people of the world um, to the Lord, regardless of race, color, origin, uh, time, or location. Okay. Um, and that's why the Lord, in his last words before his ascension, he told the apostles what? Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And know I'm with you always until the end of the age. Um, and, and, and so this is the, the role of the church. Okay. Um, so again, Catholicity here means not we're part of the Roman Catholic Church, but it, it goes above time. It goes above place. It goes upon, above a, a certain group of people okay so we covered one holy catholic last one is the apostolic right um and it, it it's pretty straightforward what we mean by this um and um before we get into it i, I think this is one of the best quotes that we can apply when we have to talk about a little bit uh, sorry we have to talk a little bit about holy tradition um and i will also provide a link on, on a whole uh, uh, lecture on the holy tradition. Uh, and I'll try to summarize it here for you. Um, and, and I'll provide the link in the description as well. Um, Saint Athanasius says, uh, beyond these things, and he's talking about holy scripture, let us look at the very tradition, teaching and faith of the church. And he uses Catholic here, um, what, I, what I just explained, right? From the beginning, which what? Number one, the Lord gave. Number two, the apostles preached. Number three, the fathers kept. Um, and, and so as the passing of a baton from one generation to another, another um, starting with Christ and continuing from generation through the, the work of the servants and ministers of the church, the faith is preserved. Um, and he says, upon this, the church is founded. And if, if someone doesn't agree with this, don't call them Christian. And, and uh, very strong words. Why? Because how, how else can we preserve the true faith without this apostolicity, right? Um, <clears throat> and um, uh, so what did the Lord give? He gave himself, right? Um, and tradition is the process of receiving Christ himself um, through the church. And, and the church gives us life because God is the life giver, but the bride of Christ give, gives us the, the, the room. Um, <clears throat> and following this holy tradition, again, we have to distinguish between what is holy tradition and what is the customs of man. Um, and please, if you want to learn more, again, go to that uh, link that we provide below. Um, <clears throat> and so the holy tradition helps us receive the Lord and walk in the Lord. Um, and and St. Paul talks about this in Ephesians chapter 2, where he says, um, the church is a building, <laughs> right? 
um, not not the building that you walk in, you know, on on Sunday, but bigger than that, right? It's um, we're all little living stones of that building, and and what is the cornerstone? The most important part of the foundation is Christ, um, and what is the the second most important um, is the apostles, uh, as we'll see. And then um, the generation of uh, church, uh, sorry, uh, century by century of the church, okay? Um, so he says, it's, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself is the chief cornerstone. He is um, the man, <laughs> right? Um, <clears throat> and so um, when we're saying apostolic, we say we can point to Christ uh, because the Christ gave it to us and we try to preserve this from generation to generation by the work of the Holy Spirit in the church, okay? And so immediate next generation uh, after Christ is the apostles, right? Um, and St. Paul talks about this um, passing on of the baton in, in 1 Corinthians 11, when he talks about, and what do we pass on? We're passing on Christ, but we're passing on the mysteries, especially the, the sacraments of the church. So Look, please, deeply in, in 1 Corinthians 11. He says, I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. Um, for I also received from the Lord, because he's an apostle, he, he received directly. Um, he talks about this, you know, especially in Galatians as well. Um, so I received from the Lord and I gave to you, right? That the Lord Jesus Christ on the same night, and then he starts talking about the sacrament of what? Um, the Eucharist, the, 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 Holy Communion, um, what he did on the night before the crucifixion, um, which is the Last Supper and the First Communion. Um, so uh, this is very important when it comes to the church and the church, because how else can we impart the proper teaching from generation to generation if we don't have this concept of passing on the baton of, of, of the, the, the holy tradition, right? <clears throat> and the, the last layer is the layer that keeps going on and on after the foundation. You have one story after another, after another, right? And, and so the church fathers are that core. Um, as St. Paul talks again, saying what you have learned and received and heard and saw in me. And then in, this is easy to remember, 2 Timothy 2.22, he says, the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will do what? able to teach others out. So he's saying, okay, there is something called, in a manner of speaking, he's saying there's something called holy tradition, which we're going to pass from generation to generation. And these people who pass it on have to be faithful um, and can teach others also. Um, and, and, and that's why there's an important process of, of all the teachers in the church, especially the bishop and the priests and, and even uh, the servants and, and the people who are sponsors in baptism, whether it's parents or other um, uh, adults who, who help uh, the continuation of the teaching of the people after they're baptized, whether they're young or old. Um, and these are faithful people who have to teach others also the, the, the teachings of the church um, without adding or subtraction. Um, so um, this is the, the life of the church is, is keeping the traditions as we have received them. So that's the understanding of scripture, how, how it's interpreted. That's the, the spiritual life, the daily struggle in the spiritual life, uh, right? The, the, the praying, you know, with the, the holy egbeya, um, the, the life of fasting, um, the, the concept of struggling against sin and what is right and what is wrong in the spiritual life. You know, we, we can't come to a saint say, okay, it's, it's, it's okay to, to, to drink and get drunk, right? No, that's a teaching of the church. It's a sin um, to, to get drunk, right? And, and um, like what I'm trying to say is there's a lot of things that um, the church teaches out, outside of the literal explanation of scripture um, that has been passed from generation to generation, um, not in addition to scripture, but uh, the, the interpretation um, is, is part of the holy tradition. And we, we see this primarily in, in three places, in scripture, in the, the writings of the fathers, and in the sacraments.
Okay. Um, so to summarize, <laughs> um, here are the, like the 12 pillars, if you will, or, or the four uh, main categories of the church. The church is one, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, right? To be holy means we have to be separated or se set apart, consecrated, right? Uh, sanctified through the sacraments and perfected by um, the, the stri striving of, of holiness and to keep oneself pure and unspotted um, by the spiritual struggle. And then there's the, the Catholicity of the church, which goes above time, place, and group of peace people. And then finally, um, the apostolic nature of the church, which the Lord gave, the apostles preached, and the fathers kept. And so hopefully this is um, a, a good introduction um, on our understanding of ecclesiology or the study of what the church is and, and does for us. So God willing, next time um, we'll discuss uh, the last part here uh, of the one baptism for the mission of sins and what does that mean? And then finally, the resurrection of the dead and life of the age to come. And hopefully we can uh, put those both in, 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 in one talk. Until next time, glory be to him now and forever and to the age of all ages. Amen.